the Australian Financial Review. Hello, I'm James Thompson, Senior Chanticleer Columnist at the AFR. Welcome to our weekly news breakdown of all things business, finance and markets. With me today, as always, is my Chanticleer colleague. He's back and recharged like an old Tesla. It's Anthony McDonald. How are you, Anthony? Yeah, James, not to 100 in four seconds. I'm firing, thank you. Fantastic. This week we examine whether the electric vehicle market has hit a roadblock. We attempt to solve the mystery of the missing Chinese stimulus and try to figure out if Santa will be visiting investors this year. But first, Anthony, I want to ask you about two stories closely connected to your dining preferences. Now, the first concerns a big restaurant business called Pacific Hunter Group, which is owned by Australian private equity bigwig Quadrant and holds all sorts of restaurant chains, including the Power Diners Rockpool and Saki, the younger and funner El Camina Cantina, the Bavarian Bear Cafes, and the Chicken Wings Beer and Sports Chain Winghouse. <laughs> now, Quadrant's owned this business for nearly a decade, but it's struggled with it through the pandemic, inflation, the cost of living crisis, and now it's all become a bit much. Quadrant's handed over the keys to Pacific Hunter's lender, which is a private credit firm called Metrics Credit Partners. Anthony, what happened to Rockpool? Is there something wrong with selling $100 steaks and $8 oysters? James, you're going to have to find a new canteen, mate. You had your own <laughs> uh, table at Rockpool, didn't you? Oh, not quite. No. That, that were the good old days of the Joe Aston experience. <laughs> what, what's your favourite Rockpool dish? Oh, I'm quite partial to the mushy peas. Is it bad to say? Oh, I, I like a steak, but the mushy peas, there's something special about them. They are. Uh, don't worry. It's not closing, James. There are just some new owners. It's been owned by private equity, like you said, Quadrant, for nearly a decade now, but it's being handed over to its lender, Metrics Credit Partners. Now, everyone's being very nice, James, about it, but the reality is the Quadrant, when it invested, it wouldn't have been in its business case to hand this business over to the secured lender. After nearly 10 years. Totally. That is not a good private equity investment. It's quite the opposite, James. It's like leaving your $96 dozen of oysters out in the sun all summer. <laughs> I don't know what went wrong. I think a lot. You know, It was a very ambitious play. It's basically corporatizing the restaurant sector. And Quadrant started with a company called Urban Purveyor Group in 2015, which had about 20 restaurants. It was Saki, Bavarian Beer Cafes. But the big headline grabber was getting Neil Perry's Rockpool yep. one year later. And Rockpool wasn't necessarily the biggest in terms of number of restaurants or anything, but it was the prestige. You yeah. know, it's, it's, a, it's a really well-known brand in Australia and particularly in the corporate circles that we're lucky enough to be part in, you get invited out to lunch at Rockpool, that's, that's like top billing, yeah, uh, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Hence why um, you know all about the menu. <laughs> so anyway, they open, they open new sites, they open new restaurants, tried some new brands and they tried to just make it a scale play. So you have a bigger restaurant group, shared back office, all that sort of stuff. But the reality is, James, that restaurants are just a bloody tough game. Totally. You know, they're, they're labor intensive. It relies on goodwill of chefs and staff and customers. You're dealing with perishable goods. So you get knocked around by yeah, food prices, wages, rent, the economy. There was the underpayment scandal that really hurt. There's dealing with founders like Neil Perry. There's management change. All of these, James, just made it a really hard investment. And what makes it hard investments even harder is when they've got stacks of debt. And yeah. being, being private equity owned, this thing's got a lot of debt. So it came to refinance the debt. Quadrant would have had to tip in more money. It doesn't want to tip in any more money. It's been there long enough. It's in a, it's in a fund that Quadrant's trying to wind up. This is the last investment in that fund. Hence why it's got to the stage where they've cut a deal with metrics. And I dare say it's the sort of deal where you know, they just throw them the keys and, and run as quickly as they can <laughs> in the other direction. It's one of those deals where there's some deals that you step back and you think, what were they ever thinking? Like restaurants are really hard. Uh, everyone sees restaurants that they have a hot run for three or four or five or 10 years if they're lucky, but they seem to limp along a little bit. E even the flashiest restaurants, we know they're not great money spinners. So there's that. And then, as you say, you're loaded up with debt and you try and corporatize something that's really a cottage industry for a reason. It's a very hands-on, mm. very experiential business. It's, it's, it's hard to corporatize. It's hard to systemize. It needs that sort of personal touch. But Anthony, please tell me, what does Metrics Credit Partners know about running a restaurant chain? 
or let alone four or five restaurant chains. I mean, th- this to me is what we've been talking about the rise and rise of private credit all year. Well, this is the tough end of private credit when something goes wrong and the private credit manager ends up operating a business. Now, surely Metrics Credit Partners are in for a hell of a ride here, Anthony. This is not going to be easy to rescue, is it? I agree with you, James. I mean, like Metrics, at one level, you could say they look smart because at least they're secured in their, yeah. in their lending, right? So they're the ones that are walking away with it. But James, what are they actually secured against? Like, what is this business? This business is basically, it's a bunch of leases and a heap of hospitality workers. And and that's it. The assets are the brands. And what's what's the Rockpool brand worth? What's it worth without Neil Perry? What's it worth with Neil Perry? What's it worth, you know, how many more stores can you open? All that sort of stuff. If you, if you look at the balance sheet of the company that owns all this, Pacific Hunter, I mean, there's about 350 million bucks worth of assets at its most recent accounts that we can see. Yeah. Half of that. 175 mil, half of that is just goodwill, is just brands, right? So that's not really like a secure hard asset. That's just what no. what someone's willing to pay f- for something, maybe. <laughs> you know, so it's it's gonna be it's gonna be really hard for them. And and like you say, like what what are they? This is a lender. Now they're the equity owner. So they've become like a private equity firm. They've they've looks like they've brought in some outsiders to sit on the board and to try and run this thing, but you know, it's it's now their problem, and their first job has to be getting back their loans, which is worth a couple of hundred million bucks. Yeah, yeah, and just to be just to be made whole, and then they'll see what they can do from there. Well, and and, and what they can do from there, Anthony, is going to be super interesting because if there was a buyer for this business, Quadrant would have found it already. Yeah. So that tells us that there's no no one out there who wants to pay up to own this collection of businesses. So. Metrics is, is going to have fun finding the exit after they do stabilize this business. So what a mess. Uh, it, it's enough to make anyone <laughs> reach for a, a long glass of red and a and a bowl of mushy peas to uh, drown your sorrows in. Yeah, mate, exactly. Now, James, at the other end of the restaurant games, our favorite burrito chain, Guzmini Gomez, which released a trading update this week. Now, Australian sales were up 8% in the September quarter. Everything's on track for the full financial year. It's it's all looking good. But James, this thing's been an absolute rocket ship. Its shares are up more than 70% since the float in June. And plenty of investors thought it was already expensive back then. What does this big move tell us? It tells us that Burrito's a big business, apparently, Anthony. Yeah, I mean, they are. The, this thing is worth $3.85 billion, right? Yeah. It's got 196 restaurants. Every restaurant, the market is telling us, is worth $17 million for a burrito restaurant, a fast food burrito restaurant. Now, these are some expensive burritos. I mean, the whole thing when this company floated was it's very expensive. I think it was trading on 32 times EBITDA to the enterprise value. It's now up to 63 times enterprise value. Mm. So this is a serious rocket ship, and it's a really tough one for investors. If you're not on the rocket ship, you're saying, oh, do I get on? Can this thing keep running? If you are on the rocket ship, you're saying, oh, is it time to get off and take some profits? So what what do you do, Anthony? Well, in a way, I wish I was on the rocket ship because you know, <laughs> it's, been, it's been a great place to be, but contrast it to what we were just talking about at Rockpool. Yeah. You know, you've got this really fine dining, this gold standard brand that we all thought is, is going bust, and then you've got the burritos going bananas. It's, it's just amazing. And, and they're telling us they're doing well because they're selling lots of these $12 chicken mini burrito meals which is a you know your mini burrito fries and soft drink for 12 bucks yeah and what they're doing well obviously is just the marketing they're firing up everyone they're they're getting more people in the door they're really creating and riding their own wave here james and yeah good on them you know but it's it's a completely different proposition to rockpool but rockpool is a good reminder though that you can you can create and surf your own wave for so long but how, how long can you keep doing it Ten years ago, Rockpool was at the top of the pops, you know, in Sydney dining, and now it's just hard. It's just hard to keep it up. Yeah, well, you can't eat goodwill, Anthony. So uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll see where both these restaurant stories go. Well, Anthony, let's go to our first topic, and this week we got a lesson in efficient M and A when mining giant Rio Tinto presented a binding, fully agreed nine point nine billion dollar bid for ASX listed lithium producer Arcadian Lithium putting Rio on track to secure Australia's biggest public market takeover this year. 
But while the deal was quick, Anthony, it was also brave. Rio Tinto's making a big lithium bet at a time when the lithium price is in the toilet, and when Arcadian's earnings are in the toilet, and when there is significant doubt about whether lithium producers like Arcadian are going to be able to cash in on the energy transition and the long-awaited shift to electric vehicles. Anthony, Rio Tinto's out in its own on this one. There are bombed-out lithium groups all over the world, yet Rio Tinto is the only strategic buyer to come out and bet $10 billion that this is all a short or medium-term hiccup, and the long-term lithium story is on track. What do you think Rio Tinto sees that others don't? It's a good question, James. I mean, Rio's really distinguished itself for a few years now compared to the other major diversified miners that it's sort of hinging its uh, decarbonisation strategy and its future-facing sort of portfolio around lithium, which is an essential ingredient in the lithium-ion batteries, obviously, that are used in electric vehicles and hybrid cars and a lot of the stuff that is electrified or will be electrified in the future. So all, all the old world miners out there, they're all making heaps of money, like cash, real hard cash on iron ore, coal, that sort of stuff, and they're choosing where to put it to set themselves yeah. up sort of for the next couple of decades that Rio's getting into lithium, which is by contrast, like BHP has been very, very negative on lithium and, and doesn't seem to want a bar of it. It's going, it's going more into potash and, and copper. So, I mean, Rio's set its strategy, right? It made its bed and it's staying strong. It thinks that lithium sort of longer term, the fundamentals are strong as that EV adoption will continue with the government supporting it. And the current route is just a short-term issue. So it's, it's set the strategy. And now the lithium share price is tanked, which is a function of demand and supply. It's really saying, okay, well, if this is our strategy, which it is, and if we believe in it, which we do, it's time to go hard yeah. and do something counter-cyclical. And I mean, that makes sense, James, if you take a long-term view, but it's also a bit of a risky move. I mean, you spoke to Rio Tinto boss Jakob Stalson this week, James, after he signed that bid. What did he say about it? Well, look, Anthony, there's a picture at the top of the presentation that Leo gave to the market on this deal, right? And it had like a bit of a graphical representation of an electric car. Hmm. And, and, and Jakob was really excited. He said, look, what do electric cars need? Lots of copper. We've got lots of copper. They need lots of aluminium. We've got lots of aluminium. They need lithium for the batteries. Guess what? Now we've got lots of lithium. I did offer to sell him a tyre... Uh, manufacturer as well, <laughs> so he could complete the vehicle, but he wasn't too interested in that. But that's the bet, right? Yeah. This is all about that, okay, electric vehicle adoption might bounce around for a while, but which way is it going? Up and to the right. It's only going to get stronger over the next few years. And and Stiles Home is, is pretty upfront. He doesn't care what the lithium price does in the next 12 months. He's mm. thinking the next 12 years, the next 24 years, the next 36 years. So, that's to be admired, Anthony, but the lithium price boils down to two things, right? EVs, lithium supplies. And what we've got here is that the lithium price spiked a couple of years ago and lithium flooded into the market. Yep. Every miner and his dog has developed a lithium project all over the world. And lithium is plentiful. This is not a, a commodity like copper that is in short supply. So that has weighed on the price. And then we've got this issue with demand. So Stalsheim's right, EV demand is growing at a nice rate, but the problem is we've now got a lot of EV supply. China, to juice its economy to try and keep its growth going, is pumping out electric vehicles at an incredible rate mm -hmm. and pushing them into the American market and the European market, and the price of electric vehicles is coming down. So that EV business is suddenly not as profitable as it once was. Does that make uh, EV builders start to think, uh-oh, I, I, I don't want to be in this business. It's not as profitable as I thought it was going to be. So it's a really mixed picture. Anthony, you love tracking new car sales here in Australia. How are EVs going here? Less than one in 10 new cars, James, or electrical plug-in hybrids last month. So I think it was only 8.7%. So, I mean, that's pretty consistent with what it's been all year. It's sort of, it's tracking around that 9% number. So I mean, the hybrids, which are sort of a combination of the two, the non-plug-in ones, they're much higher, right? They're about 14% of, of new car sales. But the majority, by far the majority of cars, like three quarters of the old-fashioned internal combustion engines, James, the fuel or diesel, the, the stuff that we've we've been driving for decades now that technology Man. hasn't changed. And, and I mean, over time, right, so the proportion of those electric and plug-in hybrids is 
increasing, right? Like if you yeah. go back to yeah. only 2020, I think the internal combustion engines made up 93% of sales. Now it's down to about 76%, right? So so it, it is increasing, yeah. but the rollout is happening slower than expected. Go back five years. If you go back even 12 months, people were telling us that they'd be selling a lot more electric vehicles today than what they actually are. So yeah. we're seeing, you know, we're seeing all sorts of forecasters uh, downgrade their assumptions. I mean, just in Australia, we had AEMO, the energy market regulator. In August, it cut its expectations for EV use by about a third in terms of the number of people that would own them in, in 10 years' time. And that cut of a third was a cut on a forecast that had made only, you know, eight months earlier, yeah. right? So it's, it's really, really hard to track. But James, I mean, the thing that we're waiting on here in Australia, like you said, it's the Chinese EVs. There's supposed to be an influx of them coming. And as you see tariffs go up in other parts of the world, the parts of the world with the big auto industries that are trying to protect, like, you know, like the US, like like Europe, there's more of them are going to find their way here. Yeah. So there's a stack yeah. of brands that are looking at launching here. James, it's, it's going to be really fascinating to see whether they take off. I mean, I'm, I'm really curious to see whether Australian consumers – jump onto a new brand of a Chinese EV that they've never heard of before or where they stick with the tried and tested, you know, Toyota, Ford and Mazda. I mean, Toyota sold, I think, more than twice as many cars as anyone else in Australia last year, right? I mean, that yeah. that's helped by the hybrids, but it, it just shows how how much loyalty there is around these car brands and how much how much trust there has to be as well. So Surely it comes down to price, Anthony. The issue with EVs is they're still, you know, basically over 40, 45 grand. If the Chinese manufacturers can come in at a low enough price point, could that be the thing that sort of win wins people over? Yeah, for sure. But it's not the only thing, James. Like this reliability. I mean, everyone yeah. just wants to get up in the morning, jump in their car and it works, right? And they and they and the average the average cars on the on the streets for like twelve years. So you want to you want to be able to do that for twelve years. True. And also you want to know that if you have to sell it for whatever reason that it's going to be worth something, that there's actually a secondary market for it. Yep. And um, I don't know about you, but I don't know anyone that's bought a second-hand Tesla or a second-hand plug-in hybrid. No. You know. Good point. It's just not a developed secondary market. It it will come, but I think it's going to take a while for us to, to all get used to it. Yep. Anthony, let's finish up here. Is Rio crazy brave or just crazy? Look, James, I like the way that they back their strategy. I mean, that, that's good. But whether they're crazy brave or just crazy, I mean, this is a big cash deal. It, it can handle it. I mean, it's got the cash flow coming in. It's got the balance sheet. It can do it. At the end of the day, though, James, this isn't another iron ore. I mean, the iron ore business it has is so good. It made US nearly $9 billion earnings in the six months to June 30 at a 67% margin, uh, right? 55% uh. return on capital. It's just insane. Now, lithium... Feels like it's always going to be smaller, more fiddly, not got the same barriers to entry as the iron ore, where it's all about infrastructure and scale. So it's interesting, like philosophically, for a, for a company like Rio Tinto, just, just as it is BHP, right? What do you do? Do you just keep doing what you've always done and you only, you only spend your money on businesses that are as good as what you've already got? Or do you have to go into these other things? And, and increasingly, management teams, they're, they're going into other things. So... I don't know. Good luck, Tim. What, what do you think about it? I was just struck by one thing that Jakob Stolzheim said. Mm. He called this a reverse takeover because Rio doesn't know a hell of a lot about lithium and Arcadium does. I, I get what he's saying. We're, we're buying expertise as much as we're buying an asset, but it just shows to me the size of the bet here. Not only does Rio have to make all of Arcadium's projects work, but it has to learn on the job. That hasn't been a hugely successful model for big miners in the past. So I think Rio's got to sort of beat the odds a little bit here, but let's see if they can do it. They, they, they want to grow. They've got a, a firm thesis and, and they're having a crack. So uh, it's going to make for a, a, an interesting journey over the next decade. Okay, James, let's move to our second topic. And in many ways, this is something that didn't happen rather than something that did. Chinese equities have been on an absolute tear in recent weeks, up more than 30% after China's central bank finally cut interest rates and announced a number of other measures to support the struggling economy. James, this is what investors had been waiting for. Finally, some evidence that China's government had realised it had had to pivot to stimulus. And on Tuesday, we're supposed to get the second piece of that puzzle. 
with investors expecting a press conference from the National Development and Reform Commission to announce a wave of fiscal stimulus measures, basically government spending. James' expectations were high. What did we get? Uh, Two-tenths of stuff all, sadly. <laughs> this, this was one of the great fizzes of uh, global business. Yeah. Um, but people, uh, you know, just watching Twitter, you know, people were live blogging this press conference, basically saying, show me the money. Where's the fiscal stimulus? And it didn't come. Mm. The, the, the press conference was basically a bunch of platitudes about, you know, how stable the Chinese economy is. There was a little bit of, oh, well, here's a old measure we announced in July, you know, recycle that. But there was nothing. Some people before the event were looking for 10 trillion won of stimulus. We got nothing. So what happened? Equities rapidly sell off. Everything cools down. Everybody says, oh, you know, is this another sort of false dawn for the great Chinese economic pivot? And away we go. But Anthony, we've talked about this before, but just take us through again the big issues facing the Chinese economy because they're growing at 4.5%, 5%. That doesn't sound too bad, does it? That's not bad at all, James. In fact, it's very good by global standards, by US standards, by Australian standards. Yeah. I mean, the World Bank says global growth is going to be 2.6% 2, 2. this year, right? So China's nearly two times that. But the problem is that China, for most of this century, I and mean, indeed the past 30, 40 years, really, that number's been at 8% or higher. So 45 5 5%, it's a considerable slowdown. Yeah. Now, the problem over there, James, is the property market, right? And- for quite different reasons to here in Australia. It's been building apartments to house the hundreds of millions of Chinese people that went from sort of poverty to middle class over the past decade or two. And I mean, the big part of that growth, the build out is the actual building, the build out's largely done. There's now massive oversupply, ironically compared to, to here. Yes. Prices are dropping, developers like that Evergrande are going bust. You got other developers that have sort of taken deposits on some units that won't finish off their buildings. It sounds like their property market's an absolute mess. Like I said, yeah. for completely different reasons to um, to hear. Now, I, I remember reading a Bloomberg story, James, a couple of months ago, and it said that China had the equivalent of sixty million unsold apartments. Yeah, that yeah. would take that would take yeah. a few years to sell. Like that, that's just astonishing. Now, as we know in Australia, James, like property, property is at the heart of the household sector. Wealth uh. and sentiment, right? When house prices are rising, people are spending, banks are healthy, the economy's good. And when it's not, not that we've really felt this in Australia, imagine it's not, not so good. So beneath it in China, you have, you have corporate debt, which is often blended in with state-owned enterprises. So, you know, there's always doubts about what balance sheets are really like. You've got yeah. government, you've got stimulus, and the government's sort of what's keeping it all together. The other thing is the the population's aging. Yeah, you know they've got a real demographic challenge. The birth rate's low, uh, so where are, where's the next set of tax payers coming from? Mm -hmm. And they've got this issue with deflation. You know we, we've got inflation here, which, which which we all hate, but they've got deflation because, as you say, everybody's so worried about the state of the property market, they're just not spending. And what the Chinese government has done to juice the economy to get that four or five percent growth rate is poured all this money into exports and investment and infrastructure, but it doesn't help people spend. The exports end up, you know, the electric vehicles end up in the European car market and, and, and frustrate the hell out of all the Europeans. So it, it, it's just a mess. But Anthony, it's worth noting that Chinese equities ran really hard mm. in the last couple of weeks, but we also saw a big move on the ASX. People were jumping into the miners and, and a little bit out of the banks. What happens to that trend now if we don't see this this fiscal stimulus from the Chinese government come through? Well, James is on hold this week, that's for sure. Yeah. Now, if, yeah. you know, I'm a, I'm a very simple person. If you just look at BHP share price versus CBA, BHP was down about 3% this week, CBA is up about 2%, you know? So I, I think it shows you there's been a little bit of that switching out, but the jury's very yeah. much yeah. St still out, James. I mean, the China trade was on and it's off. I'm not giving up on it altogether. Fund managers here want it want it to be on, right? Because a lot of them are underweight the banks, have been underweight the banks, yes. have completely missed that rally. They're ready to pile into the miners and want to, want to get the next leg of it. But no one knows, James. I don't know. I mean, the crystal ball can't see past this weekend because, James, guess what we've got? Another another press conference is called Aye. for Saturday. <laughs> Fantastic. What, what, do you think, what do you think this one will yield? Uh, I am certain what this one will yield, Anthony. Yeah. 
disappointment. <laughs> because whatever is announced, it won't be good enough, one way or the other, right? If it's only two or three trillion won, everyone will go, well, hang on, where's the 10 trillion won? So I think there will be a bit of fiscal stimulus announced in this one. We will see some solid policies they probably won't be the big bazooka 10 trillion yuan type policies, but there'll be something. But yeah, I, I think the market will come away thinking still a bit unsure. Is this China trade on or off? Because, okay, the government can uh, loosen the purse strings, start spending money, but you can't change the demographics of China, you know, instantly or even over a few years. You, you can't change the deflation or the debt problem quickly. These are, these are deep-seated problems and they will take a while to turn around. So just be wary of the sentiment. I think, um, you know, the sentiment is bouncing around crazily and, and we still might see a bit of that to come. I love it, James. I mean, you, you told us a couple of weeks ago, China was all about the Ds. You've got deflation, you've got uh, debt, you've got demographics, and now you've got disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. All right, Anthony, we'll come back after the break and ask a very important question for investors heading into the end of the year. Is Santa going to come? Back in a sec. Well, welcome back. If you want to know more about what we're talking about today and a whole lot more, AFR subscribers can sign up to the Chanticleer newsletter at join.afr.com forward slash Chanticleer. Every Saturday morning, the newsletter pulls together the best Chanticleer columns from the week and the best bits of this podcast and delivers them straight to your inbox. All right, Anthony, a busy week coming up. It all starts with the City Conference. Uh, the, the Investment Bank City is having a its annual Australian conference in Sydney, Probably the star of the show is Sarah Hunter from the um, Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank on Wednesday, and uh, she'll be speaking just before we get Australian unemployment numbers. So, a bit of an interesting day there. Yeah, definitely. Big big conference. I mean, this is one of the big few equities conferences of the year. Great great time for a conference. It always is. There's, pl- yeah. there's plenty happening. I'm sure there'll be plenty of fund managers coming into Sydney to um, see what everyone has to say. Yeah. Uh, it's also AGM season, annual general meeting season, where the shareholders of, of our big companies get together and vote on various things and sometimes uh, offer some gentle and not so gentle feedback to their uh, directors and, and, and executives. We've got Telstra on Tuesday, CBA, uh, Commonwealth Bank and Origin Energy on Wednesday and Treasury Wine Estates on Thursday. And Anthony, this really kicks off a, a month of AGMs. And we will get some trading updates, a bit of a sense of how the corporate sector is traveling. Yeah, that's what I'm watching for out of these ones, James. Well, I don't think there's any big blow-ups looming at, you know, Telstra, CBA, Origin or Treasury Wine Estates, but it'd be interesting to see if they do have any sort of update in terms of guidance, give us a bit bit more of a feel for what's happening out there in the economy. Yeah. Now, Anthony, we're going to uh, divert from business for a <laughs> sec. <laughs> As we speak, a guy called Ned Brockman is attempting to break the world record for the fastest run 1,000 miles, which Jeez. equals... 1,610 kilometres. It's been gruelling for Ned, but he's on track to beat the 36-year-old record on Tuesday. Now, he's running to raise money for people experiencing homelessness in Australia. Massive issue. We've talked about the housing market so much on the podcast this year. Um, Go online, have a look, donate if you can. But Anthony, he's running at Olympic Park, which is not far from your place in Sydney. He's doing 403 laps a day. Can you imagine what that's like? Mate, I can't imagine the condition of or his poor, poor feet and legs and everything. What a, what oh. a tough, tough human. Uh, Ned is. Good yeah. on you, Ned. Good luck. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, hopefully you can listen to the Shot to Clear podcast and get a few more laps in as he goes round. Well, Anthony, we love questions on the podcast. This week, our question is from Jenny from Northcote. If you've got a question you want to send in, you can email us at shantaclear at afr.com. You can also send us a question in audio form. Just record a voice memo on your phone, include your name and where you're from, and email it to us. And that's exactly what Jenny's done. Hi, Chooks. This is Jenny from Northcote calling in. Um, Love the show. We're just heading in towards the end of the year. Um, It's already October and we've had daylight savings and Christmas party invites, all of that. Um, So, look, often towards the end of the year, we see a bit of a Santa rally. And I was just wondering if you think we're going to get the same sort of um, rally this year or is there just too much going on and it's all a bit too uncertain? Um, Okay, thanks. 
Anthony, I know you'd be writing your Christmas list at the moment. Mm. Is uh, a visit from Santa to bump up your portfolio on there? Well, James, it's one of those things that tend to happen every year. And is it going to happen this year? Well, I mean, there's a lot going on this year, as Jenny said. It's sort of clouded by the US election, the China stimulus, the US Fed and interest rates, uh, what the RBA is doing here, the domestic economy, our own election, the government's sort of putting the building blocks in place for that, the Middle East. The reality is, I don't know, but it's a very firm trend. I mean, I was just looking at some AMP numbers this morning uh, when Jenny's question came in, James, and the S&P 500, August and July, it's worst months. It's best months of the year. Uh, October, November, and December, right? <laughs> in, in Australia, it's April, July, and December that are by far the best months for returns, September the worst. So look, James, if I had if I had a bet, I'd say it goes with history, right? That's what the uh, the long-term trends say. But, you know, as Jenny said, there is a lot going on. Yeah, I think there probably is a good chance we get a Santa rally. I'm not sure it's going to be a spectacular seismic one, but just the, the, the all year, the ASX has kept grinding higher or as um ubs calls it melting up and mm. i think that can keep happening that rates are coming down next year uh they're already starting to be cut by the fed you know i think the corporate sector is feeling a bit better yes the election uh, clouds are, are going to be hanging but investors tend to look through that so well, i think there's a good chance we just keep grinding higher coming into the end of the year which i, I think investors would take that because it'll end up being a pretty good year anthony Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you for your help this week, Anthony. Uh, I don't know if you've got uh, either Rock Paul or Guzmani Gomez on the menu at home <laughs> this week, but whichever way, whichever way you decide, uh, bon appetit. Thank you, James. Have a great weekend. See you next week. If you like the podcast and you want to hear more, consider sharing or giving the podcast a review as it helps other listeners find us. And don't forget to follow wherever you get your podcasts. At The Financial Review, we investigate the big stories about markets, business and power. For more, go to AFR.com and you can subscribe to The Financial Review, the daily habit of successful people at AFR.com slash subscribe. Chanticleer was hosted by me, James Thompson and Anthony McDonald. And it was produced by Alex Gow and Lap Fan. Our theme is by Alex Gow. The executive producer is Fiona Buffini. The Australian Financial Review.